welcome back to another Tech Minds video. So in this video, I want to talk about 10 most common mistakes users are making with software defined radio. Now, when I come up with the idea to create this video, I had in mind that this would be more geared towards newcomers to software defined radio or shortwave listening. So if you are a veteran SDR user, then most, if not all of the points made in this video may be nothing new to you. However, stick around, maybe I mentioned something you had not thought about before. So in no particular order, apart from the last one I'll talk about, let's get started with number 10. So which STR software should you use? Well, in my experience, there is not a clear defined answer for this, and it really depends on what you're doing. SDR++ is an extremely good go-to SDR software package because it supports all of the major SDR devices, plus it works on various platforms such as Windows, Linux, and even Raspberry Pis. However, if I'm using my SDR Play products like the RSPDX, then I would use SDR Uno. Although SDR Uno can look overly complicated to a new user, it has some great features. Now currently, SDR Uno is only supported on Windows, although I have heard they're designing a cross-platform version. Now SDR Console is another great contender of SDR software, with multiple SDR devices fully supported. What's also nice about SDR Console is that if you have an SDR which is capable of transmitting as well as receiving, such as a Lime SDR or add-on Pluto, then SDR Console has the ability to transmit. In fact, I use SDR Console for all of my QO100 satellite work where I'm using an Adam Pluto for transmit. SDR Console does support the HackRF, but only for receiving. Even though the HackRF can transmit, there's currently no support for transmitting with the HackRF from SDR Console. And one of the most popular and versatile applications is SDR Sharp from AirSpy. As well as supporting their own products, they support a whole host of other SDRs. The most popular SDRs would probably be the RTO SDRs and of course their own AirSpy products. A top level feature of SDR Sharp is the ability to load plugins. Now as SDR Sharp has been around a while, there are many, many compatible plugins available. Now if you install the community package from AirSpy website, then it will automatically install all of the top used plugins. Now when I talk about plugins, I mean extra pieces of software which adds further functionality to SDR Sharp. For example, if you like to decode data from satellites, such as InMarsat, then there's a plugin which will help you decode these signals without the need for third-party software and audio routing. Now that's just one example, but there are many plugins available, and I urge you to investigate them if you haven't already. I do have lots of videos on this channel which demonstrate how to use some of them. Now at number nine, we touch on a popular topic where newcomers to the SDR hobby struggle to get their SDR device working with the SDR software. Apart from faulty or cheap clone issues, device drivers will be near the top. However, there are some devices which do not need device drivers, like the AirSpy products, so they're just plug and play with Windows. RTL SDR dongles and SDR Play devices do need the device drivers loaded. SDR Play device drivers are installed as part of SDR Uno, and you can download the API separately if required. Now, the most common way to install drivers for RTL SDR devices would be to use an application called Zadig, Z-A-D-I-G. Now, there are many tutorials on the internet on how to use that device driver, but I'll link in the description below if you're not sure where to find it. Now, at number eight, we find ourselves talking about coax. Now, coax is the name of the cable used between your receiver and your antenna. The type of coax can greatly reduce or improve reception depending on the frequencies that you're using. For example, lower frequencies, say sub 30 MHz, we can use less expensive coax as there is less loss at lower frequencies. However, if you're wanting to receive on frequencies, say from 100 MHz upwards, then you'll have to consider the type of coax used. Generally, as you go up in frequency, the coax can become thicker and more expensive. But why spend hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on radio equipment if you're just going to use coax, which is not fit for the purpose you intend? An example would be someone using RG58 coax to receive aircraft on one gigahertz with a 25 meter cable run. The loss experience in that cable run with RG58 could mean you're not receiving all of the aircraft your antenna is actually receiving. 
So my recommendation would be to always look at the specification of the coax before you purchase it, with in mind the frequencies that you want to receive. Now most coax specs will provide a loss measured in dB over a specific length. You'll be surprised at how lossy some coax can be at specific frequencies. When using SDR software, you have a visual representation of the signal that you're listening to, something which you cannot do with a standard radio. What this allows you to do is analyze the signal and make sure the bandwidth setting is covering the entire signal. For example, if you're listening to ham radio chatter on the two meter band, then you'd most likely require a 12.5 kHz narrow FM setting. Whereas if you were listening to a broadcast radio station, then you would need to select a wide FM mode at roughly 192 kilohertz. Now this can also be applied to SSB communications. Most ham radio operators use 2.7 or 3 kilohertz for their bandwidth. However, you do come across some folk that like to use wide ESSB 5 kilohertz signals and of course those inconsiderate operators that just splatter with faulty equipment. For CW reception, you would further narrow the bandwidth and this can help null out close adjacent stations and the same applies to the voice portion of the band. So moving on to number six, and here we're going to talk about the time of day for specific frequencies. Anything above 50 megahertz would not normally be affected by day or night as comms on those frequencies would normally be line of sight. However, below 30 megahertz, and we start using the ion sphere to bounce our signals around the world. Depending on the time of day, where you are, will depend on which layer is more reflective. Now disregarding sunspots and the effects that they have on radio signals, let's just talk about the regular layers which affect radio signals day in and day out. For example, it's commonly known that 80 meters, 3.5 megahertz, works very well in the early morning and obviously in the evenings throughout the night, but during the day it can be less effective. Whereas during the day we may find that 20 meters, 14 megahertz, is working great for local DX and long distance DX. But then come early evening and the signals just fade away. This is the result of the F, E and D layers and how they react to reflecting your signal back to earth depending on the time or the position of the sun. There are other factors such as propagation, sunspots etc which can also disprove those comments as it has been known to work 20 meters through the whole evening and night with grade DX during peak solar maximums. Now this is something that you learn as you experiment and progress with the hobby. Now early on, on point seven, we talked about bandwidth, but another important thing to remember is the modulation type. Now these consist of SSB, AM, FM narrow, wide and stereo, along with all the different digital modes. Now although a digital mode isn't specifically a modulation type, it's worth talking about. So how do we know what modulation type to set on our STR software when trying to receive a signal? Well, there's a couple of ways. Either you will already know the modulation type depending on the frequency you're on, or you can just select a different modulation type until you hear something intelligible. For example, if we're on the 80 meter band, then the modulation types is mostly lower sideband. The same goes for the 40 meter handband. But when we start to go up in frequency to say the 20 meter band on 14 megahertz, then voice changes to upper sideband. Now, while this is true for most times, any mode can be used on any of the handbands, and it's not uncommon to see other users either using AM or the opposite sideband. So if a signal doesn't sound quite right, just try changing the modulation type until you can hear something intelligible. If you still have problems, just double check the frequency and bandwidth, and then adjust if required. Now, there's lots of different settings within most SDR software applications that can become overwhelming to a newcomer. One setting, which is quite important, is the gain setting. You could have the gain setting too high or too low. Now, if the gain setting is too high, then you'll most likely overload the receiver and start introducing what is commonly known as sprogs. These could be signals that are not really there. Either it's a harmonic or something internal or just distortion. Now, luckily, applications like SDR Uno have an indication to let you know when you're overloading the front end of the receiver. Always adjust this so that your receiver is not overloading. Now as well as setting the gain too high, you can also have the gain too low. A result of having the gain too low could be as drastic as not receiving anything or not receiving a signal as well as you should because the gain level is set too low. 
I guess the game setting is down to the user to adjust as required. Applications like SDR++ and SDR Sharp do have an automatic gain control, which will monitor the incoming signal levels and self-adjust so that the gain is not too low and not too high. Now it has been said having the gain control too high could potentially damage your SDR receiver, so it's always worth checking this setting. Now common mistake number two could actually be a top common mistake because most newcomers will buy something cheap to test the water and see if they like this kind of hobby before spending money on better equipment. Now unfortunately, cheap doesn't always mean good, especially if you're purchasing a cheap fake clone. It's always been accepted that clones of products, not just SDR, do exist in the real world. Now these clones will be advertised as one product, a product that is well known to be good in the community, but these clones or fakes use subpar components or just not even built to the same specification. Newcomers then fall into this trap of buying clone products and are expecting to see great results, but the reality is that the experience is just frustrating and puts the user off furthering their interest in the hobby. My advice would be to research the product you're looking at and make sure it's being sold from a reputable seller before parting with your hard earned cash. As a starter SDR, I'd recommend something along the lines of the official RTL SDR Blog 3D USB dongle or maybe even a new ELEC SDR. If you want to dive straight into quality SDR, then you can't go wrong with AirSpy or SDR Play devices. Now antennas have been placed at number one because I firmly believe that the most important part of your receiving or transmitting station is the antenna. Now you could spend thousands of dollars on radio and SDR equipment, but if your antenna does not work very well, then you're not going to get the best experience that you should. I get asked a lot about the types of antenna ones should buy and use, but this is a difficult question to answer because everyone has their own circumstances. For example, you may not have a large budget or you may not have enough space in your garden to install an antenna. You also have to think about the frequencies that you wish to receive. Now there are many multiband antennas on the market, most of which require some kind of antenna tuner to work, while some can be made to work multiband without further tuning. If we're talking about receiving only, you still need a resonant antenna for the frequency you want to receive. Maybe not exactly on resonance, but close to it. Some people will argue that you can use any antenna for receiving any frequency, and in my opinion and testing, this is not true at all. Well, if you want to actually receive anything. The advice I would give to a newcomer would be to look at installing two antenna types. One for VHF and UHF, you can install something like a ham radio dual band collinear, or even something like a discone antenna. Although in my opinion, discones don't work particularly well. For frequencies of 30 megahertz and lower, then all you need to get started is a long piece of wire, as long as you can get it and install it as high as possible. For receive purposes, this would work really well, especially if it's resin on the frequency of choice. Now my personal antenna at home is a multi-band N-fed half-wave with the use of a 49 to 1 transformer at the base and that provides me 80 to 10 meters or 3.5 to 29 megahertz resonant on the same antenna. For more information on this type of antenna, you can find a video on my channel. Now unfortunately, the lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength, which in turn normally means the antenna needs to be larger if it's not loaded. So we've talked about VHF and UHF, and HF, but what about the higher bands like LoRa on 868 or ADSB on 1 gigs? Well, for these bands, you would really need a dedicated antenna designed for these frequencies. Don't forget, you don't have to purchase antennas. You can make them at home and probably for a fraction of the cost of a commercially made antenna. This kind of hobby is great to experiment. Of course, if money is no object and you have all the space available, then purchasing the largest HF antenna or installing a VHF UHF antenna on a 50 meter mast would work really well. Well, there we go, guys. Hope you enjoyed the video. And if you learned something, then that's great. That's my job done. If you've got any comments or disagree with anything that I've said or want to add to any of these points, then please feel free to leave a comment down below. I'll be interested in reading it just as everybody else will be. Until the next video, stay safe, take care, and thanks for watching. See you in the next one.